What are some of the lessons that we can learn from the old world order for the new world order? Well, I think the first and most important lesson is that if we want to build a community of nations in North America that goes beyond just enlarging the market, uh, that we have to give serious thought uh, to what our vision of the future is. Uh, and more importantly, how all three countries that are quite independent and sovereign ought to relate to each other in a modern 21st century world. Our economies now are very integrated. Our societies are growing increasingly integrated. What's needed now is a North American idea for all three. Uh, an idea that not only defines our shared history, but a shared destiny. If we are to progress together and collaborate in a new way, it's also important for us to develop a sense of being something larger, a sense of being part of North America. Right now at the elementary school level, we by and large learn about our country and about how we differ from our neighbors and the rest of the world. I think it's time now to also learn, in addition to how we differ, what we share in common and what North America is as a whole. It's more than just a geographical expression. I think that students should have a mandatory part of their curriculum that not only teaches them about their country, but also about their country's place in North America. I think from the elementary school level, the secondary, the university level, you can develop on that foundation uh, a great deal more knowledge about what we have in common, about the problems that we share, about strategies for addressing those problems. Uh, and so right through university, we should have uh, centers on North American studies that research and, and examine these questions and help all of our peoples know more about each other than they currently do. Frankly, Mr. Ambassador, we lack the trained men who would be able to plan and implement operations in an area we think is vitally important. Because of this, we are also requesting that your team of advisors include a senior officer who is thoroughly experienced in uh, psychological operations. Very well, sir. I think we can provide you with an expert on the subject. He is concerned with its people, their way of life, their religion, their culture, their sense of national identity, or lack of it. He must know the people of Hostland for their minds will be his primary objective. He reviews the psychological objectives the United States hopes to achieve in host land. Once the people start to consider themselves as a national group, acceptance of their government tends to increase, thus making penetration by subversives much more difficult. Psychologically, the people must be convinced that if it were not for the insurgents, these restrictions would not be necessary, and that when insurgent activities cease, restrictions will be removed. As the people are affected by the program, so the program is affected by their changes in attitudes. A successful PSYOP program will make them perceive things from the desired viewpoint. What thoughts will pass through his mind? What images will he see? What factors will push him in one direction or another? When you run the world, uh, you tend to study uh, how other people have run the world. Just like if you run a successful business, if you want to be a filmmaker, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you might study other business models. The people that currently run the world studied how the people before that ran the world and now want to create a scientific dictatorship. And that means they want permanent and total control over the world uh, forever, so they never have to worry about revolutions again. So oligarchies have always been worried about revolution, always been worried about the people revolting. Oligarchies even popularized the idea of exile uh, back in the 1200s, 1300s, where if the king of France got deposed, then he or she uh, could go to England. And if the king or queen of England got deposed, they would be exiled to France. So oligarchies were so worried about the people uh, rising up in rebellion that they popularized the idea of exile to make that normal and make that an accepted thing you do to make sure you didn't kill your royal family who was a part of your country's history. Incrementally, they conditioned us to say that it's none of our business to look into things like giant multilateral trade deals that will affect every 
area of our society. They make it seem like it's not our responsibility. We have experts to take care of that. And the less we control our environments, the more apathetic we get. Placing the frog in a, uh, um, a pot of cool water where the frog is very comfortable and uh, you gradually turn up the heat so that you don't, it, the, 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 the change in heat is imperceptible until, of course, the pot is boiling and uh, it, then it's too late to do anything about it. That's what's happening uh, now. So gradually, step by step, and gradualism is a process that Karl Marx ta talked about. This is right out of the Communist Manifesto, that if you move in baby steps, they're imperceptible. People simply don't take notice. Would you prefer to follow a careful, uh, incremental, small step-by-step -step approach or prefer, prefer a bolder vision for the future uh, and to design and pursue that vision? And an overwhelming majority uh, of both Canadians and Americans said yes to the bolder vision. And the people, I think, are ready the way I interpret the polls is not that they want a North American Union, but they are quite pragmatic about different ways to relate to each other uh, and open to new configurations in North America. They learned long ago that you cannot just take it by brute force. I mean, when Hitler tried to do it, you know, uh, you know just, just take it by brute force, it doesn't work. The people will always prevail. So they, they've learned their lesson and they realize that now you have to do it through stealth, you know, through things like propaganda and controlling the media and the education system. And basically turn it around so that the people are in complete and total acquiescence, that they will literally beg for their own enslavement. By doing incrementally these changes in our laws and our land, then one day we'll all wake up and say, oh, that's just the way it is. But it was not supposed to be that way. You can come across a border with a, an army with all of your military uh, uh, machinery, and people say, oh my gosh, we're being attacked. But right now we're being attacked, but incremental changes is a way that people don't see that the arrows and bullets and guns and cannons are blazing at us, and we don't recognize that. So most people aren't aware because of what they've learned from the media, and what they learned in school, and <laughs> it's, it's amazing how quick information spreads these days. So that's probably why uh, people have such a hard time waking up sometimes, because the, the, the conditioning runs deep. If you get into an elevator, and there's 20 people on the elevator, and 19 of them are facing the back of the elevator, well, uh, by social conformity, although you'd sh the right thing to do is to face the front of the elevator, because that's where the doors open, to fit in with the greater crowd. You turn around and face the back, don't know why, but this is what seems to be the status quo. When you have incremental damage, and it keeps increasing, you can wake up one morning and realize that something has to be done. Well, you get political change of fundamental nature of this sort only if you have a real big earth-shaking event. 9-11 was an earth-shaking event. The Great Depression was such an event. Two world wars costing millions and millions of lives and casualties among European countries was such an event. They drive changes. The European Monetary Union was the outgrowth of people who lived through at least one of those wars to try to avoid it in the future. Y probablemente no porque tú sabes que los más ricos en tiempos de crisis todavía no. Nosotros seguimos haciendo la lucha por la subsistencia cotidiana. Well, I certainly agree that it's when uh, periods of great instability and chaos, you, you have the greatest opportunity for creating new institutions and moving in new directions. I think it is obvious from any study of history, world history, that the greatest initiatives have usually emerged, originated from some crisis of some sort. The United States Marshall Plan would have been unthinkable after World War I, but after World War II, uh, we were prepared to give a substantial amount of money both to winners and losers to help them to recover. It was quite a dramatic, and it really did require a crisis. A dual crisis, one 
the end of the Second World War and the second, the prospect of uh, Soviet invasion of Western Europe. I think we needed a crisis to have social security, to have the Works Progress Administration. In 1935, Franklin D. Roosevelt put his signature on the Social Security Act. This social security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens who will reap direct benefits through unemployment compensation, through old age pensions, and through increased services for the protection of children and the prevention of ill health. 